Welcome to Sartor TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton, and today I'm talking with Joe Elvento, the author of License to Sell. Thank Joe, you, Jennifer. Thanks for being here I, today. I, it's a pleasure. I wonder why you wrote License to Sell. So, License to Sell, it's um, selling is a passion of mine. Uh, people always ask, when did you get started in sales? And I could honestly say I got started in sales when I was about six or seven years old. Those of you who remember way back when, in the back of the comic books, there was these kind of greeting cards that you could sell. And if you sold so many boxes of greeting cards, you'd win prizes and like bicycles or fishing poles or whatever kind of wacky things there were. And so starting at six years old, I started to get the catalog and started knocking door to door, literally walking through my town selling uh, greeting cards. So that gave me the sales bug, uh, certainly early on in life. And then I, going forward, had an opportunity, lots of different sales roles. I uh, had an opportunity to see Tom Hopkins, who was my idol. He wrote a book called How to Master the Art of Selling. And, um, and so that was a, definitely a transformational experience. And then I had an opportunity to do some sales training. So sales was always there. And then finally got to the point where if you're doing a lot of training, you're doing a lot of speaking on sales, eventually people say, Joe, you should write a book. <laughs> and so full circle, that's what was the motivation to genuinely put together the, the license to sell book. What is the central thesis? Well, I think the, the key behind the sales piece is, just like I started, I think anyone can sell. So oftentimes, um, we'll deliver trainings and sales trainings, and I'll just modify the title to say how to sell your ideas. Mm -hmm. Because whether you're actually selling to customers and actually closing and selling a product or a service to someone, or if you're internally, if you're in a corporate environment and you're just selling your ideas to others, I think that ability to sell and that knowledge of how to put together a sale and how to present ideas in such a way that they genuinely appeal to the other person and get their heads nodding, mm -hmm. it's what you want to do. And, and so that's really the, the motivation and the kind of the, the rationale behind the book, the thesis behind the book, is that, that ability that anyone can do it and the book really shows them how. Who should read License to Sell? Who would it help the most? I think um, certainly anyone who's going into a sales role, who's never had any formal sales training, I think that it's an ideal book because there's about 120 or so sales strategies from all, from everything from prospecting right on down to handling objections. So it really covers the gamut of selling. And it's positioned and presented in such a way where they're just, it's bite-sized learning and you get to apply what you've learned instantly after you read each chapter. So certainly the beginning uh, s stage of things. The other side of it would be if you're, de oftentimes we're dealing with sales pros. So somebody who's just looking to brush up on their skills or somebody who's just looking for an angle or a different a way to approach something is certainly another opportunity or a reader that might come in. And then the third one is the, the, the folks I talked about earlier, the people that don't n necessarily sell for a living but have to sell ideas. Mm. So they could definitely learn something from him. Most people, don't really present ideas in such a way uh, from a sales perspective, uh, but those who do or know how are much more effective, tend to have more influence, uh, they tend to get more of what they want. How do you become what you call a customer champion? Customer champion, well, the way you become a customer champion is you don't get to call yourself a customer champion, it has to come from the customer. Mm. So the customer makes those awards. And one of the ways you become a customer champion is truly to be seen in the customer's eyes as that champion. So the champion definition is the ability to understand and do what's right for the customer, to advocate for the customer. So you're selling a product or service. The question is, if the customer doesn't have a need, do you still sell the product or service? There are some salespeople that will. Um, I would argue that if the need doesn't exist, Part of being a customer champion is to um, let them know that the need doesn't exist. And maybe you'll circle back with them in six months or a year, or you'll check in with them when their need increases. And therefore, you've become a customer champion in the sense that you're doing the right thing by the customer. What is a 21st century salesperson? 21st century salesperson. It's interesting because when we wrote the book, it was in the 20th century. So we were actually kind of a little bit ahead of ourselves yeah. uh, from that perspective. 
One of the things that we wanted to talk about in that 21st century salesperson is someone who's using electronics, somebody who's using data, somebody who's using computers, somebody who's using, at the time the web existed, but certainly not to what it uh, does today. So the idea is using as many of the tools that are available to you as possible to be intelligent in the way that you prospect, in the way that you uh, kind of engage with your customers, in the way that you follow through with your customers and go from there. How has technology changed sales in the time uh, since you wrote the book? Yeah, big time. I just can't get over it how much has changed. Mm -hmm. You can go right back to the, the Olympic greeting card days uh, of selling door-to-door uh, -door, where everything was kind of paper-based and you, you had kind of triple at the triple press hard order forms and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, but certainly in the, you know, the 1980s, there was tickler files. So there was, you know, you didn't really have computers that were kind of uh, widespread. So when I said I was, you know, if I contacted you and I said, well, you may not have an interest now, do you mind if I call you back in 30 days? Well, there are these things called tickler files. They called them 1 through 31 files. Well, 1 through 31 meant 30 days from now it's going to call you back. So if 30 days from now, today's the 15th, 30 days from now would be the 15th. So I would slot you back under the 15 of my index cards and then eventually have a stack of people to call back on the 15th. So part of that is that process. So think about it today. There's all kinds of software that's available that keeps track of that. That will even make the call for you. You don't even have to dial. You pretty much hit the button, the dial, you know, you're plugged in to your computer, your head, headpiece rings, and you simply go forward from there. Um, there's all kinds of sales forecasting models. There's all kinds of lead generation. Again, uh, we used to get the old DMB leads that were just index cards. Um, or in our sales environment, uh, back in the days of cable and wireless, we had a wall of telephone books from every city <laughs> in the country. So you'd pick a city that you wanted to sell in that day, and you'd pick the, the yellow pages off the shelf, and you'd start dialing for dollars. Uh, <laughs> and that's the way it worked. Uh, most people started with the A's. I always started with the Z's, and I had success because everybody started with the A's. <laughs> uh, so you figure if every, every customer, every salesperson in the world was picking up the phone book for Atlanta or New York or wherever it might be, they're always starting at the A's. By the time they got to the C's, they were tired. I always went to the Z's and worked backwards, and peop those people never got called. So Smart. they were happy to hear from me. What are the top three skills that people should hone for successful sales? First one is you have to have skills. Uh, you truly have to um, understand some of the components of what comprises a sale and understand the concept of what I refer to and what the book refers to as this kind of understanding a customer need. So you have to be able to probe, you have to be able to ask questions, and you have to be able to listen to those questions and understand the difference between an opportunity, a problem the customer might be having, and then an actual need that might exist. So the ability to ask the questions and the person might have a problem with this or they're having challenges with that, just because they have a problem doesn't necessarily mean they want to solve it or do something about it. They might have other pressing problems or other priorities that are more pressing than the ones that you're working with. So that ability to ask the right questions, uncover opportunities, uncover problems, ideally be able to then convert those problems um, and then transition into the ability to present features and benefits and solutions that will address those problems or that particular need and then ultimately get in the customer to say yes. So a skill set, understanding the, the dynamics of what makes up a sale or the construction of a sale and some of the components associated, the difference between an opportunity, a need, features, benefits, how to close, how to handle objections, because you have to have that framework in mind so you kind of know where the conversation is going at any given point in time when you're dealing with a customer. Uh, then finally, and of course, the ability to listen for those needs and then the ability to convert those needs into an actual sale. One trend happening is that customers want everything right now. <laughs> yeah. So how do you deliver? Yeah, so it depends on whatever it is that you're selling. But let's assume what you're selling is going to take some time. So if the customer wants something immediately or right now, you should be in a position to be able to offer something immediately or right now. In the days of email, in the days of PDF files, in the days of information, there's certainly, if I'm gonna sell a product or a service, well, there might be some training associated with how to use it. There might be instructions on how to 
build it or operate it or set it up or whatever that case might be. So even though it might arrive a few days from now, there could be information you provide today, right now, that can get them geared up and ready so when it does arrive, they're ready and willing and able to kind of implement right then and there. So that's certainly one approach that you can use. And if you bake that in, as that just seems part of the natural process, then that delay between when the order is placed and when the customer actually receives something, you could leverage that time and just make that part of a natural part of the, the sales cycle and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. You may know there's a delay, uh, and for whatever reason there might be a delay. But from a customer perspective, you could position it in such a way that it's really an opportunity for them to do some learning in the interim. You offer a lot of better, different, faster types of strategies. What do you think is the most important strategy that you offer? I think one of the biggest things that I found helpful is building value. Um, and if I can use an example, if you don't mind me, I'm gonna take my shoe off for a moment. Um, I had a salesperson, I had a sales manager. I was very fortunate to have a sales manager early in my career. And we were selling something that cost $10,000. And we had a, it was a cold closed type of environment, which meant that we didn't see the customer. We didn't know who was coming. All we know is we met the customer for the first time. We had, for the most part, about, about two hours, two and a half hours to make the sale. And they left. And the, and the, the sale was about a $10,000 sale. So we're all complaining we don't have the ability. We, it's, it's too much money. We just can't do it, whatever the case was. Well, this guy took off his shoe and he says to the, the audience, how much would you pay me for this shoe? And we, he went around the room and we just said nothing, 25 cents, 50 cents, you know, whatever. It was a smelly shoe, kind of like this one. And, uh, and so then he finally says, okay, I'm going to take off my watch. And at, at that time, he had a Rolex. I'll take my electronic eye watch here, here, and throw it in. He goes, now how much would you pay me for this shoe? And we went around the room and some people said $100, $150, and so on. And then he took out his wallet. And, and he always put, because we had $100, if we made our sale that day, he'd put $100 on the bar and we'd drink till it was done. And back then that was, <laughs> that was uh, a lot of beers. And so he stuck his wallet in the shoe and he said, now how much would you pay me for this shoe? And we went around the room and people would say $200, $300, $250 and so on. And then finally, as you know, I think it was standard issue back in the 1980s uh, with the type of sale we were selling, he kind of took off his gold pinky ring, uh, we had a little diamond <laughs> in it and he stuck it in his shoe. And he says, now how much would you pay me for this shoe? And people went around the room, $500, $700, $1,000. And then he said, if somebody was to walk in that door right now and I asked them, how much would they pay me for this shoe? What would they say? And people were saying 50 cents a dollar. He goes, what was the difference between you wanting to pay me 50 cents, that person walking, and now, right now, within just two minutes later, you're willing to pay me $300, $400, $500 for this shoe? He says, the difference is you've had the benefit of a presentation. And he says, that's what we're asking you to do. So it's simply a matter of how you present your features, your benefits, your story, your product, your service, that determines the value that the customer perceives. And so if I was to come in knowing the value of this shoe, if I was to sell it to you for $100, would you buy it? And the answer would be yes. Um, and you wouldn't have to think twice about it. So if you build, if we're trying to sell something that costs $10,000, if you build 15,000 or 20,000 of value into it, now when you ask for something that costs 10,000, it's gonna be a no brainer. From that story on, I was the top sales rep um, in that environment, and I, it just changed. It you know changed my life. So, I would probably say you know going back to your question, what's the most important thing? What's the biggest value um, you can bring to the table, or the you know the the best technique? That to me is a game changer. It's a mindset changer because it gets in your head. It's a paradigm shift. Once you have that mindset of that you can influence how people perceive the value and what it is that you bring to the table, that changes everything. And to me, that's the power of sales. That's what's fun about sales. And how you sell is different than the way I sell, which is gonna be different than the way someone else sells. So we all have our stories to tell. It's just how you kind of string the words together and tell the story that, that creates that impact. What's the benefit of doing a soundbite presentation? So keeping it very succinct. So soundbite presentations, um, I just did a webinar on this topic just yesterday. And the idea of uh, a soundbite is, is critical. So if you think about it, 
because and it, it was interesting. So you think about the trend these days. We went from, say, the New York Times, and just big, kind of long, lengthy articles and the way that that's set up. Then you remember kind of USA Today came out, and that was kind of the short version, you know, real easy to read and colorful. kind of yeah, colorful <laughs> and colors and graphs and charts and things like that. And then you kind of went to the internet, and now you're starting to get blogs, and people would be blogging stuff. And now you have micro blogs. So not that blogs were long enough. Now you have to have a micro blog. Mm -hmm. And then now there's Twitter, you know. And so things are getting shorter and shorter. So, so it kind of comes back to that sound bite mm -hmm. presentation. So people's attention spans are changing. And uh, for you to be able to capture somebody's attention, you have to do it in such a way that sound bite, that are sound bites. So think of headlines. So I always say, if you're writing an email, if you're gonna be presenting to a customer, what's the headline? What's the New York Times headline? What's the New York Post headline read that's gonna capture that person's attention to then say more or tell me more about that? And so that sound bite presentation piece is becoming more and more the norm these days. You have to grab attention. How do you prepare for a hostile customer, an indifferent customer? How do you prepare for things like that? So that's part of the thick skin that you have to develop as a salesperson. And it's probably the biggest reason why people who think they want to go into sales eventually leave sales, mm -hmm. is they can't handle that rejection, or they can't handle that hostile customer, or that indifferent customer, um, or the no, right, that comes into play. And it goes back to kind of the knowledge worker, right? So if you're just selling your ideas internally, um, oftentimes, you know, they'll present an idea, the boss says no, and they turn around and they leave. Mm -hmm. Well, any good salesperson knows you never take the first no. It might take six or seven no's to finally get to the point where you say, are you really thinking maybe this person doesn't want to buy this product or service? Because you have to kind of have that mindset of being able to handle objections. So how do you handle that, that hostile or that indifferent uh, customer or that, that tough objection? Um, part of it is you have to be prepared. So. There's different strategies to use depending on the issue that comes up. But for the most part, somebody who's hostile, doesn't want to talk to you, who is indifferent, you're not going to be able to have a long-winded opening. So open probes or telling a long story, it's just not going to work with these folks. So oftentimes you're going to switch to a closed probe. So real short, did you know about this? Have you seen the recent fact? Uh, whatever that short little message is, are you having an issue with X, you know, whatever that might be. So you try to zero in, drill down really super fast to kind of get them to say, at least think about their issue or to think about a problem that you might be able to address. So targeted probes that kind of get at a nerve or that hit a, a either a, an opportunity area, so preparation, homework, knowledge of your competition, knowing who's in right now and kind of going after their Achilles heel, their weak point or whatever that competitor uh, is you know, normally known for or you know, is a drawback for that particular competitor. The second piece to handle the, that particular type of a uh, scenario is to have proof sources. So if you have that indifferent or that skeptical customer, they're not gonna believe you. And so as a result, you have to have data, you have to have stats, you have to have some type of third party reliable or reputable proof source that you can point to. And it could be a magazine article, it could be um, an independent survey, there's lots of third party kind of companies out there that rate folks and rate companies in the four box, the, you know, the strategic uh, four box models. And so if you could point to that, that really helps. Or you know, some comparison of competitors where you came up on top, something like that. And that helps handle the, either the hostile or the indifferent customer or someone who might be skeptical of your claims. Because of course, you're the salesperson, what else are you gonna say but it's the greatest product <laughs> in the world? But when you have the proof source behind it or multiple proof sources, even better, that helps. Why is taking the time to build a relationship with a customer important? And how do you go about doing that? I'm a big believer in professional selling. So I'm the type of person that I really want to build the relationship first. And to me, it's first and foremost. And that if I can build the relationship with you, uh, that's what counts in the long run, whether we do business or not. Uh, and it has to be genuine. It has to be sincere. And just as I said earlier, you might find a customer that doesn't have a need for your product or service. That's, and for you to say, 
not right now or you know thanks but no thanks it's not an you know it's not something for you at this point in time i could see that here and even recommend something smaller or an alternative or to stick with what they have that's part of the trust that's part of the relationship building that you have knowing that at some point in the future either the opportunity may grow to the point where they do need your product or service or the customer may leave to go to another organization that now is a much bigger organization that does have a need for your product or service. That relationship carries through. And then ultimately, by building that relationship over time, it's the ability to kind of start small and continue to work your way up um, the ladder with regards to the offerings that you're able to bring to the table. Nowadays, relationships are key. And in the olden days, you kind of had to maintain relationships. And if somebody was to move out of town or move companies, if they didn't tell you where they were going, it was kind of hard to keep track of them. But nowadays with LinkedIn and Facebook and everything else and all the electronic means to kind of keep tabs on folks, you, whether they move across town or across country or around the world, you can continue that contact. And so I have folks calling me back all the time, asking questions, asking advice, um, you know, asking for insights, whatever it might be, because of the relationships that we've built over time. So relationship is the key. Whether you do business or not, it's the key. Uh, and I'll mention one other thing. I can't tell you how many times a day I receive vendor calls, people trying to sell me things, especially if it's a phone call, uh, that they'll call once and I'll never hear from them again. Hmm. So part of that is just persistence. And so to me, the relationship is you start with what they call a, a cold call. I don't know you, you don't know me. But even if I don't get to know you, and even if you don't answer the phone, that cold call, I'm going to eventually turn into a warm call. So I might send you a piece of information. Again, people they might send emails, but I'll also send a piece of a kind of snail mail, um, usually lumpy mail. So it gets noticed. So they, it comes on their desk because nowadays to get a letter in at your company uh, and it's on your desk and it's there's something in it, there's something lumpy in it. Um, that's <laughs> rare. I, I mean, you might get one of those a month. So right away, it's going to start to say, well, who's this and start to make a change. Sending postcards, just FYI, sending clippings. Hey, I saw this article about your company um, and you start that relationship. And even though it might be one way, you consistently call. So again, it might be every 30 days, I just give the person a call. And I might vary the times that I call. So I might call, try to call real early in the morning or real late in the evening or later in the evening, as opposed to kind of nine o'clock Monday morning when everybody's busy. Um, but eventually the person's gonna, I'm gonna connect with that person. And now I've taken that time to build that relationship from a soft perspective. So now it's a soft call and a soft relationship. It may still not be an opportunity. And then eventually, once I've had the phone conversation, just to initially figure out, is there a need now or maybe down the future, and just ask permission. Do you mind if I give you a call back in 90 days if there's not? People don't object, but the point is you have to do it. So again, I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. people call, but they never call back. Mm -hmm. I've never heard, they just don't persist. And they'll send me 100 emails because emails are automated these days. Yeah. And it's so funny, they think that they're being clever in the way that they write their emails, but you can tell there's software behind it because you get the same email practically with the same language from four different vendors in completely different industries. So you know it's kind of the, the model or something's kind of firing emails, kind of what the first email says, the second email says, you know, the, the third email, you know, and so on. And, and they're getting more and more clever these days. So that relationship piece is critical. And I, I just I can't underscore that en enough in differentiating yourself as a salesperson and, and truly elevating you above your competition. What are some of the personal traits of the super salesperson? Well, I, I think one of them is that relationship piece. Yeah. To me, a super salesperson is someone that you just create a bond with, you have a relationship with. There are people that didn't know before, strictly a vendor relationship at first, but these are people that have slept over in my house. And this is after we've done business. Um, we've gone golfing, we've gone to events, we've, we've traveled together. You know, we kind of keep in touch with what's going on with the kids and the family and all those kinds of things. So you end up with this kind of personal relationship that exists. There's a, a gentleman, I just reached out to him on LinkedIn. I just happened to see his profile. Haven't talked to him in 15 years. Uh, and he's the CEO of a, of a big company now. 
And I just touched base. I said, do you remember the trip we took to California? At that time, I, you know, I was dealing with the rep and he was maybe the VP of sales for a region or something at the time. But we connected as if it was nothing 15 years ago, because at that point, 15 years ago, I was about the relationship and we really had some fun times and some good times. And it was about that kind of relationship and it stuck. And so it enables you, those relationships enable you to pick up 15 years later where you left off. And to me, that's that's key. If if I've never pursued it, if I never followed through or for that matter, if those folks never followed through with me or created that relationship, I, you know, I probably wouldn't even recognize the person if I saw them. So it, it does carry through. It really does help. How can you cultivate a perception of trust and credibility with somebody? How do you start that process? If you think about trust and credibility, that's, that's critical. The concept of trusted partner is a big one these days in the corporate world. And trying to position yourself as that trusted partner or be seen as that trusted partner is critical. And the way you do that and the way you become and how you cultivate that trust is to really deliver and do what it is that you're going to say that you say you're going to do. So uh, set up an expectation, deliver against that expectation, ideally exceed that expectation. So if you're going to send something or you're going to follow up on something, do it. Do it the next day, do it the day later. If you're going to be delayed for whatever reason, maybe you're traveling or, or something comes up, let them know. I'm delayed for a week. I'll get you something on Wednesday. If you say you'd like 10 minutes of their time just to do a quick kind of needs analysis or to share whatever it is that you want to share with them, at 9 minutes, 50 seconds, you want to stop and kind of note the time and say, I said I would take 10 minutes of your time. We're at 10 minutes. If you want me to continue, it's because you want me to continue. Um, I'm ready to pack it up now. And more often than not, again, the fact that you followed through, mm. you said something, you're a person of your word, and then the person will say, yeah, no, let's keep talking. And if, if there's a genuine need, if there's not a genuine need, that's okay too. Because again, I'll say, do you mind if I touch base in 90 days? So there's never a see you later, go on and, and no, just touch base, you know, kind of keep building that warm file because eventually the warm file will become hot and eventually it'll lead to a sale. It might take years, but it, I'd rather walk in the door or be working from a bunch of warm leads than complete cold leads where I've had no relationship or no experience prior going in. Why is it important to plan out a series of questions for your customers? It really illustrates your professionalism and whether or not you're, uh, you, know, you know your craft and you know your trade. Um, nowadays, people don't have time and, and you've probably dealt with salespeople, um, maybe somebody who's new or somebody who's not really experienced and it's painful, mm -hmm. right? You're, you know, they're trying to do a demonstration and things aren't working or something's just not going right or whatever the case might be. So to me, a salesperson gets paid for what they say and how they communicate. So it's only right to have a series of questions or to have some kind of a, a question methodology designed in such a way that's efficient and that gets at the customer need you know, effectively. And really what you're doing you know, from a behind the scenes perspective is you're qualifying the customer. But you wanna do it in such a way that's not offensive, that's not over the top, that's insincere, that puts the customer off and just feels like they're being interrogated instead mm -hmm. of actually having a conversation. So those types of, you know, having a series of questions really helps. And to me, I, I like to start kind of at the big picture. If I understand what a problem is with the customer, I'll then I just won't assume because they have this problem, it's something they want to solve, as we said before. Just because this problem exists doesn't necessarily mean they want to do something about it. So we'll talk from the problem. I'll then probe further to determine how important is it is. Is it a priority in compared to other problems they might have? Where does it kind of stack in the importance factor? Um, from there, I'll talk about quantifying it. So I want to kind of understand um, how often does it occur? Um, how much is it costing them? You know, those kinds of pieces. So try to get some of the metrics associated with it. And again, a series of questions to kind of tease it out. 
And then from there, take it a step further into consequences. So what happens if they don't act on it? You know, what's the cost of keeping the problem laying around or, you know, kind of the hole in the bucket? You know, what is the hole going to just keep getting bigger and bigger? Or are you filling stuff up on one end and it's just leaking out the other? And what's what do those consequences look like to you personally, to the department, to the company, to the customer? So again, tease all that out in a series of questions. And then finally, you ask permission, would they like to see what you could do about that particular issue? Or would you like to see how you've been able to address that issue for, say, a competitor of theirs? And right away, they're saying, well, if you're doing it for a competitor, mm -hmm. maybe it's in my best interest just to see it. I'm not asking them to know. sign up. I just want to say, are you willing to hear about it? Well, of course, if I was smart, I'd want to hear what my competition's doing about a problem that I'm faced with as well. If anything, it's free information. So by kind of asking a series of questions, I go from problem and I put a lot of hooks on it, you know, so I, I kind of attached a lot of hooks and that enables me to then hang the various features and benefits and follow-up conversations and proof sources and so on as we go through the rest of the presentation. If I don't ask those series of questions and I just say, oh, you got a problem here, let me tell you, I'm going to fix it. Mm. I, I don't really have an understanding of what the issue is. I don't understand consequences. I don't know how often, how many. I don't understand if it's important for them to do anything about and so on. So to me, that those series of questions or, or that kind of web of questions that you ask all comes together. And it's really in the best interest of both the customer and of course you as the salesperson. What's the difference in crafting these questions between an open-ended question and a closed-ended question? And is there a better time to use one or the other? Yeah, absolutely. So again, this goes back to those kind of core skills uh, from a salesperson's perspective. Now again, this you could call that kind of sales 101, um, but a lot of times when you're dealing with non-salespeople who are selling ideas, they don't really understand the value mm -hmm. or the strategy behind an open-ended question or a closed-ended question or open probe and a closed probe. So for the most part, yes, in general, you typically want to lead with open probes. You want to get people, you know, tell me about what's happening now. Tell me about your business. Tell me about what keeps you up at night. Tell me about some of your business challenges. Tell me about what's driving your business, some of the economic trends, you know, whatever those open-ended questions might be. If you can get people opening up and talking about some of the business drivers behind uh, what they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, that's the best thing you can do. But going back earlier, and then you pepper in the closed probes to kind of clarify and confirm. Mm. So you said earlier about this being a business driver. Let me yeah. ask you, the Fed talked about raising interest rates this week. What impact is that going to have on your business? Is that something you need to do, something, you know, act sooner or later on? Is that going to help sales or hurt sales in the long run? So tie in some things. So you go from that open-ended question to, you know, tell me, is this going to help or hurt? It's a closed-ended, it's an either-or type question, it's an alternative choice type question. So you could kind of pepper in those questions as you go. And then um, we talked earlier before about, say, somebody who's indifferent or uh, somebody who's skeptical. Typically, those folks, you have to start with closed-ended probes. Mm. So they're not going to be, tell me about your business. You know, they'll say, now get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> tell me about your business. That just doesn't, that's not going to work. I might only get one question to ask. So what's the one question I can ask that's going to tempt them, maybe tease out a little more or to kind of lead to allow me to ask a second question and maybe a third and a fourth and kind of open the door from there. What are some different customer traits to just be aware of as you go into a meeting with potential customers? And how do you deal with different traits of the people that you're targeting? Yeah, so the ability to read a customer is important. So as a salesperson, and whether it's visiting face-to-face, -face, of course, that makes it a little easier, or dealing with them on the phone, because oftentimes initial contact might be a qualifying call or a, or a prospecting call of some type. So some of the things that you can uh, tell. First is, what's their title? So from a title perspective, you can sometimes um, understand what are some of their traits. So if I'm dealing with a CFO or somebody in the finance department, well, what are they going to be interested in? They're probably going to want to talk dollars, money, savings, you know, cost of something, whatever the case might be. If I'm dealing with the COO, the operating officer, they're probably more interested in productivity, um, how things can work, if I'm efficiencies, things along those lines. If I'm dealing with marketing folks, 
they're probably going to be more likely to be wanting to hear about the image and the value or the perception of using one product over another or the impact on their customer, the perception of their customer of adding value. So things like that. So sometimes just the title of the person that I'm calling, it gives me an entree into the types of questions that I might uh, want to ask. Um, I might have all three in the room. So as a result, when you're presenting, you kind of have to mm. spin your benefits a little bit to kind of appeal to each of their needs as well. The other piece, too, is just some basic dynamics. So is the person, is it formal? Are they wearing a suit and a tie? Um, you'll tend to be more formal. You could model. So are they sitting forward? Are they sitting back? Um, are, you know, is everything at their, on their desks at a right angle and everything kind of neat and clean? Maybe they're a little bit more analytical. And as a result, you're probably going to want to walk in with an appointment. You're probably going to want to lay out an agenda. You're probably going to you know, ask, you know, keep uh, kind of relatively tight time frames as to you know, covering off on your agenda. At the same time, if you walk in and things are kind of all over and they're in shorts and flip-flops and a Bahama shirt and something, you know, a little bit more, you know, less structured, um, I'll probably end up, you know, peeking in, probably leave the, co the tie in the car, okay? So you're going to want to help put them at ease because otherwise it's just that mismatch uh, that occurs. So some subtle things that you could see, visual cues, some of the data cues that might exist and some homework cues that might exist as well. When we talk about on the phone, you think about tone. So from a tone perspective, I, I mentioned I worked with cable and wireless early on in my career and um, I was working on the phones. I, I just moved to Washington DC area. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll start on the phones. Well, what was great about the phones is instead of having a geo territory that was say Northern Virginia or DC or Maryland, I had a national territory. And by having that national territory, I talked about the phone books uh, up on the wall, is you were able to call Atlanta, or I was able to call New York, or I was able to call Philadelphia. So I knew if I wanted a quick yes or a no, I'd call New York, because you got a quick yes or a no. <laughs> I knew if I wanted something, if I wanted to talk or maybe ease into a Monday morning, I'd call Atlanta, because they were nice and they, you know, they would talk to you. Even if they said no, they'd still talk to you for five Southerners, minutes. Southerners, right? Yeah. So, it's, so it was that kind of a mindset. So sometimes you could just tell by the tone of their voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they tend to talk fast, you'll pick up your speed. If they tend to talk a little slower, you'll tend to back your speed down. So part of it is, is kind of mirroring and mm. that comfort level. But it has to be genuine. It has to be sincere. And it, by all means, has to be professional. What's the difference between features of a product and benefits? And which one do you think sells customers more? Yeah, so again, this goes into that sales 101 stuff, but for people in the corporate world, they don't necessarily say it. They'll just present, not really understanding the mm -hmm. difference between the two. So if you think about the feature, a feature is a characteristic of what it is that you're selling. Okay, The benefit is the value to the customer. So the feature, you know, if we, if we look at the coffee cup here, it's uh, something that could be branded, you know, a white background, so it's, it's the ability to label it, whatever the might, that case might be. So the feature is that it's white, and, the, and the, the benefit is, from a marketing perspective, it enables pretty much any type of imprint to be put on it and be easily seen you know, from across the room or for advertising and promotion or whatever that might be. You know, the, feature, the feature might be it's made out of ceramic, but uh, and because it's kind of a heavier duty cup, um, that it's going to stand up to being washed over and over again. As a result, I'm not going to have to replace them as much or they're not going to be break as often. So it's going to save me money in the long run and so on. So that could be a financial benefit if I'm dealing with the CFO or it could be an ops benefit if I'm talking about kind of productivity or efficiencies associated with the service. So the idea being is that the benefit side of it is really the value to who it is that you're working with. So the feature could be the same, um, but the benefit mm -hmm. is going to vary based on the need of the customer or what the customer is looking for. So what's more important? I would have to argue the benefit is what's more important. Uh, and the benefit is certainly because it's, it's what that value is. And just like that $200 shoe we talked about, <laughs> You could see it, you know, if I don't put too much effort into it, you know, you could see that the cup is being worth a dollar or worth ten dollars. So when I when you find out the price of it as five, you think it's a good deal. If you think it's a dollar and I tell you it's five, well, the sale's probably not going to get made. How do you deal with the fear of no? Dealing with fear of no. So if you're thinking about getting into sales, <laughs> that's lesson one for sure. 
I think one of the best things that you could do for the fear of no is just understand that sales often, you could refer to it as a, as a numbers game. So if you think about it, if 20% of the people say yes, that means 80% of the people say no. Well, for many times, depending on the environment that you're in, if 80 out of 100 people say no to you, you're probably a successful salesperson because translated, that means you have a 20% close ratio. And oftentimes a 20% close ratio is a, is a good thing, depending on the sale. So sometimes it could be 50%, could, could be 70%. I mean, every industry is gonna vary. But so you have to understand that the no, whatever that ratio is, is a no, one more no to get you to a yes. Hmm. So if I have a 20% close ratio, I know I need eight no's to get two yeses. Now, granted, I might get, you know, 16 no's before I get my four yeses, and the 16 no's might all come in a row, and then the four come at the, at the end. So I have to kind of figure the math. But part of that no and having to deal with it is to understand that eventually it's gonna to lead to a yes. And that those percentages or those metrics or that numbers game is gonna eventually work in your favor. Mm -hmm. And that as you get better as a salesperson, your percentage of close, your percentage of yeses goes up. So as a result, you go from a 20% close rate to a 22%, to a 25%, to a 30%, and so on. And eventually you get to a point where you, you kind of have a, a market, you, you get comfortable with the materials, you know what works, what doesn't work, you know how to ask your questions, and you kind of optimize your, your selling environment. So that to me is the rejection. So it's kind of a roller coaster. Uh, you think about it, you're on a real big high when you get the yes and then you get the no's and it's kind of that, <laughs> that dip down again. And then eventually you're kind of ticking back up again, you get a yes, you're at the high and then again you kind of go to the no's again. Ideally what you want to do is in your mindset, if you can think about uh, the ratio perspective, you don't really you know, have the no's impact you. When you get a no, you're like, thank you very much, I got a no. You're saying on the inside, thank you very much, I got a no, I'm one step closer to a yes. So instead of that roller coaster kind of of emotions, you can kind of level it off and be kind of professional and kind of have that even keel. So when you get to know, it's not a big deal because you know it's one step closer to a yes. What are some effective transitions into a close? I always find it funny. Um, sometimes people will say, uh, you know, the customer will say, that's great, when can I get it delivered? And you'll have salespeople say, so now, you mentioned earlier that you're also interested in color. So let's start talking about, wait a minute, they just said, when can I get it delivered? So the idea is you gotta listen for the close. <laughs> so if they're ready to close, if they're ready to buy, if they're asking when they can get it delivered, if they're asking, you know, that's it, you're done, stop. <laughs> you know, sign them up, you know, don't keep going on. So how do you transition? One, you gotta listen. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be careful that you don't say, I, I, wait, I'm not that, um, you know, here's my script or my mental script. Script. I'm not done yet, you know, you still mentioned one more thing or I still haven't talked about this other stuff. I, I mean, so that transitional close is when the customer is ready to buy, sell them, okay, move forward, sell them. You can always come back, you can always add information, you could always, after the sales made, you could talk about colors or, you know, if there's some other loose details. But if they're in that buying mode from a, from a customer perspective, by all means, capitalize on it um, and, and make the sale. So listen, that's the first key. The other piece is, in the beginning, remember you're asking questions. So I'm talking about needs and I'm talking about opportunities. So you might talk about a problem and I might say, so tell me more about that. And you might say something like, is this something that you want to address? Is this something that you want to solve? Is this something you're ready to kind of put some investment behind? And the person might say yes. So I'll note that and I have that particular problem or that need kind of tucked away. Let me ask you, what else? What are some other concerns that you're having with XYZ company or with your current solution or whatever? And I might get another one. And again, I'll probe around it, get some details. So I got that one, and then I'll put that one over to the side. And, and you'll continue to kind of tease those out because otherwise, if you kind of just work with the first one, you get all the way through, you, people negotiate, they get all the way done, and then they're ready, you know, they've given away the sink, you know, the kitchen sink. They've talked about, you know, um, how they're gonna deliver and they've gone through a lot of details, a lot of their presentation, only to find out to, when they go to close to say, well, wait a minute, there's also something else. So in a way, you have to go right back to the beginning and here you've done this big, long presentation or you've talked about the details, but yet there was this other piece of it that was very similar that you could have talked about together 
with maybe, again, same feature, but the benefit just might have been spun a little differently. So now it's almost as if you have to do the presentation again, but this time yeah. talk about it from this perspective or a COO perspective or a marketing perspective or a, you know, a finance perspective. If you only knew that up front, you could have done it together. Mm. So the other piece of it is if you have a couple of needs or two or three problems that you've identified and I ask, is there anything else? No, that's it, okay. Then I finally say, okay, I'm ready here. Present, and once I've presented, if you agree on the benefits, you see value in the benefits, then I'm ready to close. So that's the other piece of it. So I want to transition as to when that's going to happen. Joe, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing all of your insight and wisdom from this esteemed career that you've had. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It was a pleasure. This is Sarder TV. Thanks so much for being with us today. We've been talking with Joe Ilvento, author of License to Sell, and we hope we'll see you next time.